meaning to them now I'm a, since I'm an orphan. Amen. There's nobody left in my side of the bloodline. My mother and father passed on the other side. My mom passed away, as you all know, and we were on our way through here the last time. I was headed to be with her, and uh, she lasted another couple of months after that, I guess. But uh, what a joyous thing, amen, to have a saved mother and father. You know, my father was an old drunk, got saved, and he died gloriously. I mean, his was just amazing. He went out preaching Jesus. He went out telling folks about heaven. I mean, he went out just, I mean, with a high hand, you know. And uh, my mother, I watched my mother. My mother was still dear to me. And I watched my mother lay in that bed, and, and she, uh, she had got dementia, and it started... Dad had the kind where you get a little funny, you know, and he, he got forgetful and forgot me a couple times. Mom forgot me a couple times, but she had the kind that makes you mean, and she was starting to get mean, and I prayed one night. I said, God, would you just please be merciful to my mother? She wouldn't, she's not a mean woman. She ain't got a mean moan or bone in her body, and then I questioned the Lord. Did you ever do that? I questioned the Lord one night. And I said, Lord, uh, why my mother? Why is she suffering so? My dad, he, you know, it was like he, didn't, he, he was in pain, but he didn't, he didn't let on about it. But my mother had pains that they said were, you know, like, like psychosomatic because of the disease. And, and uh, all I could tell the doctor is, look, man, that woman's in pain. You better do something to help it. And so she was get, she'd get fitful, just, you know, and she'd get, if she was sitting down, she'd say, i got to get up. Well, Mom, you are up as high as you're going to get. Well, i got to lay down. She'd be laying down. I said, Mom, you are lying down. One day she said to Linda, she, Linda standing at her feet, she said, my feet aren't in the bed. Put my feet in the bed. Mom, Mom your feet are in the bed. And so I just kind of put my head like that. My wife and her moved her feet about an inch. She said, oh, thank you. You know, just enough to. But I watched her go through that and, and just, boy, just rip my heart out. And uh, I said, God, why my mother? You know, my mother's a great woman. She was a great mother. My mother was the very first human being to ever be put on the kidney dialysis machine as a guinea pig. And they didn't even know if it was going to work, but it had worked in rats, so they figured they'd try it on her, and it did. Thank God it did, because I got my mother. Uh, I was about six months old before I really had a chance, but she came home, amen. And... Uh, so there she was with all that, and, and I said, Lord, uh, man, she's suffering so. Dad's was glorious. Hers is glorious. Why is it that way? And a preacher friend of mine just texted me out of the blue, you know, and he said, and he gave me some verses that morning that, I mean, unsolicited, just God just laid me on his heart. He sent them to me. Romans there, in Romans 8, I believe it is, where it says, uh, for I reckon that the sufferings of this present world are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. And God said, her glory is yet to come. And then I read on down through those verses, and he finished out with 1 Peter 5.10, that the God of all grace comfort you, establish, strengthen, settle you. After that, you have suffered a while. Comfort you, strengthen you, settle you, establish you, strengthen you, all that. And uh, make you perfect. And the Lord spoke to my heart. He said, son, I'm just trying to make her more perfect. I said, thank you, Lord. So mom came, it came the time we were in church on a Sunday and the call came in and we got up out of church and headed for the nursing home. We were trying to get her back to the house. She wanted to die at home. So we uh, got back to the nursing home there and it was obvious she was, going down, and it would be that within just an hour or two. And so we walked up. So when we walked in the room, my wife got right down where Mom could hear her real well, and she said, Mom, I know you wanted to go home. We were trying, but it don't look like we're going to make it. Mom, it's just as far to heaven from here as it is from home. You go ahead and go. But Joe, I watched my mother just lay back and rest. The fits kind of calmed way down. And she laid there for about an hour and a half or so. And boy, all of a sudden, you want to talk about the glory of God coming into place. Whew. 
You know, it's so much better when they don't dope them up to where they're completely out of their mind, even though she was out of her mind. But I'm going to tell you something. She wasn't out of her soul. Amen. That soul, man, can't touch that thing. And she lay there, and she was laying down a little bit, and all at once she picked her head up and looked up like she had just been surprised with the greatest birthday surprise ever. Her eyes got about that big around me. She just, and a big old smile on her face, and she just laid back, and that was it. Man, I'm telling you, she got one look at the other side and said, let me go out of here, amen? It's a blessing to know what heaven is, amen? It's a blessing to know, amen, that you do have somebody over there. And it ain't just mom and dad for me, it's friends, it's loved ones, others, and, and, you know, comrades in arms, and people that I've served with, and people I've known, and people I've won to Christ, and I mean, uh, one of our preachers that we trained from Kenya, I don't know if I told you, when I was here last, if it, I might not have been in time enough to say it, but uh, he went home to be with the Lord, sitting in his easy chair, never had taken an aspirin, 72 years old, Brother David Carriage, Tom. I mean, he went home like that, boom. He was singing, by the way. I took him, uh, uh, I went back over there back in, oh, whatever it was, eight, somewhere. I took him a VCR tape, remember those? <laughs> of the, the camp meeting songs from Charity. That somebody had put one together, just all singing. And he loved I'll Fly Away. And his wife gave me this testimony. She said, Brother Cliff, he was watching that video. And they got to that song that everybody likes. He's, he, you know, I'll fly away. And he got to the point where he was singing with it. And he sang, I'll fly away. And the next thing he did, flew away. He just flew away right up to heaven. I mean, no, no aspirin, no drop dead, no pain. No, sitting right in the easy chair. I mean, what a way to go, amen? I mean, there's a lot up there. That, it's worth it, folks. Listen, I've been at this thing now for going on 43 years. You know what I'm finally getting to do, Brother Joe? I loaded a lot of boats. I loaded a lot of ships. I loaded a lot of wagons. I put a lot of load, amen, on board, Joe. You know what's happening now after 42 years? I get to unload some gems. And God gives me the privilege of seeing and hearing from things he's done simply because Amen. the preacher said, I just went where I was told. And I was there at the right time. I got a picture on my phone. Anybody want to see it, I'll show you later. But Brother Andrew McAfee went over to where we started in New Guinea. And we left New Guinea in 1994. Was that almost 30 years ago? And there was a fellow who had gotten saved that I knew of, heard of, that he'd gotten saved even, but you didn't see this guy. His name is Poo Poo. Now, before you get all the, yeah, okay, that's we do for wind. You know what the wind does, right? You know what the Bible says about the wind, right? It lists where it does, and you can't see it and all that. But you know what you can see? You can see the effects of the wind after it's gone and while it's there a little bit, but. Poopoo was that way. You, nobody ever knew when he was around, but after he was gone, you could tell he'd been there. Poopoo was a witch doctor boy. It's like a doctor boy, like a PA here. And he was a, a witch doctor in training. And one of the assignments he had was a fellow named Cliff Taylor. And he was trying to kill me. And for six months, I lost 100 pounds. I had no idea, man. I thought it was amoebic dysentery. I blamed it on that for a long time. But I found out that after that length of time, when he couldn't kill me, he finally figured out that my God was stronger than his God. My God was bigger than his God. And he came, and of course, being who he was, he didn't mingle with the crowd. Again, he's like the wind. He didn't mingle with the crowd. He sat outside a church, and the church is so far back in the bush, it's the farthest out church that we had. It's about a, a six-hour walk from the, where you get off the road at for me. And so I would go there every Sunday and preach. Well, what he did, what Poo Poo did is he came and he sat outside the church, out around the back, right by the door, and he listened to the preaching, and he got saved. 
Only thing was, again, he's like the wind. He got saved and he blew out. He lived so far back in the bush. Listen, he lived alone. There was nobody around him. Nobody wants to live next door to the witch doctor. Amen. So he lived out there in, the, in the, what they call the big bush by himself. And so I saw him one time just in passing. That's it. That's all I knew about him. Oh, then I'd heard he got saved. That's it. Now, fast forward to, to 2023. And in walks Andrew McAfee onto the property where we started. And this old man, gray-haired, gray-beard, walks up to him. And he says, I want you to take a picture of me and take it back to Brother Cliff. He said, who are you? My name's Poo Poo. And he told him a little bit. Didn't tell him much, but he told him a little bit. And then he said, I want you to take this picture back to Brother Cliff. I want him to know that I'm now here on the mission station serving God. He came out of the woods, amen. He finally got enough courage from the Holy Ghost, I reckon, to come out and dwell among Christians and no longer have that name, no longer have that, that testimony, that, you know, that whatever you want to call it, stuck with him, Right? He wanted everybody to know he's a Christian. Amen. And he wanted me to know that he's a Christian and that he's serving God. Joe, that was, I mean, nearly 35 years ago. And God just let me unload that little gem. So you see, Cliff, it's still coming in. It's been worth every mile, it's been worth every trial, it's been worth every hardship. It's been worth every heartbreak. It's been worth every problem. It's been worth every uh, good time. It's been worth it all just to stay in the race and do what I told you to do. I'll tell you this. Hey, bro, Tom. I got my glasses on. I knew that was you. It's been worth it all just to do. There'll be times you do what God told you to do. How many times somebody called you crazy? And even the things you do, man, they look at it and say, and, and guys look and say, I wouldn't do that. Praise God, don't. You're not me. Yeah. I'm me. But my job is to obey my God and do what I'm told to do. Amen. My God is to go where he says go, when he says go, so I can be there at just the right time 35 some odd years ago just so a, a, a man could get saved. You ever sent, God ever send you anywhere just for one? I could tell you stories all night tonight. I'm going to say this. Serving God's the greatest thing I've ever done. And I'm just thankful tonight that God has Amen. given me the grace to stay in the saddle Amen. and not quit. I mean, I've had friends along the way that have, I mean, killed themselves. I've had things happen... And it just, I mean, why? Why would a person do that? Man, I'm telling you, despair is terrible. We're going to look at a group of folks tonight. Take your Bible, go to, uh, where was I? Exodus chapter 32. Exodus chapter 32. Folks can get off track so easy. It doesn't take much. And they don't really realize what they're doing. Listen, you think I knew what I was doing? <laughs> Most of the time, I'm just, like Brother Earl Hughes says, I just bumped around through trouble until I bumped into God. <laughs> Amen. These folks, man, keep the main thing the main thing. Keep Jesus Christ for, foremost. Amen. Number one. Keep his will the main desire of your life. Say, man, I'm coming down to the end of it. Keep his will the main desire for your life. What Paul say in Acts 20, 24, neither count I these things dear unto myself, but I, what do you want to do? I want to finish my course with joy. Amen. 
Here we are in Exodus chapter 32. And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, make us gods which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what is become of him. And Aaron said unto them, Break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives, of your sons, and of your daughters, and bring them unto me. And the people brake off the golden earrings which were in their ears, and brought them unto Aaron. And he received them at their hand, and fashioned it with a graving tool, after he had made it a molten calf. And they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. Let's pray. Father, again, thank you for your goodness to us. God, we don't deserve one bit of it. But Lord, sure is good to revel in it. God, sure is good to dwell in it. Sure is good to have it upon us. Thank you for being so good, so kind. Thank you for reaching down in that pit where we were. And more than that, you got down in there with us, lifted us out. And God, you set our feet upon the rock and you gave us established goings, Lord. Lord, I pray you'd help folks get established even more. And I thank you. Father, please speak to our hearts now tonight. Best I know how I give you the vessel. ask you to fill it to overflowing. And may that overflow speak to each heart. We'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. You know the story, amen. It's the golden calf, and you hear a lot about it. I got thinking about this thing, and as I travel, I mean, I run into them everywhere. Man, there's a great horde of golden calves nowadays. Amen. And what I want to look at tonight is what happens when you make a golden calf. Amen. Say, what are you talking about? We'll get there. I'm putting a little wood on the fire. We're building steam. Amen. I want you to notice Moses, they they started off with, because Moses was slow. He wasn't getting there, you know. He wasn't getting there fast as they thought he should. Well, Moses is up there with God, and God ain't always in a hurry. Amen? In fact, I don't think God's ever in a hurry. But if he does get in a hurry, you better be on the boat or you're going to miss it. Amen? So you better be doing what God said do when God comes by. Or when God says, go here, go there. If you're not, amen, that willing to, amen, mind God and do what God said do, you're going to miss God. I met an old lady one time, and she was in a church where I preached, and I preached on Romans 12, 1 and 2, gave my testimony. She came to me crying, and she said, Preacher, thank you. I said, well, praise the Lord, you know. No, really, she said, I mean thank you. I said, well, thank me for what? Thank you for doing exactly what God called you to do. I said, ma'am, I didn't have any other way of looking at it. I had to. Man, that's the best thing to do. And she said, well, you, let me, so I said, okay, I, I, I'll, I'll let her tell her story. She began to pour out her heart to me. She grew up in a Baptist deacon's home. At 16 years old, she gave her life to Christ to be a missionary. She was already saved, but the Lord spoke to her heart, and she said, the Lord called me to be a missionary. So I went home, told my daddy, the, the deacon, Went home and told him that God had called me to be a missionary. My dad's face got red with anger and ire. Looked at me and said, if you leave the shores of America, I will disown you. That's a deacon, folks. That's supposed to be a spirit-filled Baptist. Shame on him. Shame on anybody that would not want God to put his hand on their children and use them for his glory. See, what happens? They usually get spread all over the world. But amen, it's great to know what God's doing with them. I get to see mine once in a blue moon. Amen. But that's okay. Why? Because, hey, heaven, amen, that's what heaven is to me. I'm going to be together with my family, and we'll worship and praise God and hallelujah Jesus for all of eternity together, amen. So that ain't in my notes. I was free. So here it is. I want you to notice 
that all the people broke off the golden earrings. And look what they gave them for. They gave them to make gods. Now, stop and think with me a minute. Where did those earrings come from? Anybody know? That was of the spoils of Egypt that God allowed them to get. Why did God allow them to get it? What was it going to eventually be for? It was going to be the beaten gold and the fancy gold in the tabernacle. It was to go for the glory of God. But what did they give it to? You get a golden calf, you'll start giving God's money to it. And you'll be giving God's money to the wrong things. And one day it'll be too late. Wait till you get to the end of the chapter. So they started, what, what did he do? They gave God's money away that was, amen, supposed to be for God's glory. By the way, you tell me I'm supposed to tithe. No, I'm telling you it all belongs to God. How much he lets you have back is, amen, a good way to look at it. So they gave what God intended for his sanctuary to build a false god. And then Aaron made it a calf. Notice that. Aaron made it a calf. Look at that. Look there with me in verse 4. He received it with their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool after he had made it a molten calf. So he gets the thing red, I mean, white hot, whatever it is, black hot, whatever, super hot. And he starts messing with some tools there, and he forms that thing, and he cleans it up and, you know, puts a little artwork in there, makes it look all pretty. Why? Because it's a golden calf to the calf god. Amen. And then they said, these be thy gods, O Israel. So they gave God's glory and honor to an inanimate object. And then, look at this, verse, Aaron builds an altar before it, makes this proclamation, tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. No, it's not. That thing ain't the Lord. Amen. What happens? They begin to lie. Psalm 78, 36 says this. Nevertheless, they did flatter him with their mouth, and they lied unto him with their tongue. Why? Because they're messing with golden calves. Amen. And then it says this, verse 6, Exodus 32, And they rose up early on the morrow and offered burnt offerings. You know what they've done? They've sold out to the God of play. What did it do? It said there they sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. And they gave this thing gold offerings, uh, burnt offerings, sorry. And they rose up early. You know what the main reason we ought to rise up early is? God. Amen. I mean, study your Bible. Look through the book of Psalms. Early. Amen. Early. Those, that, that early time. I don't care if you work night shift and you get up at noon. The early times ought to be God's. He, he deserves the first fruits of the day, doesn't he? Amen. And so they sold out to a false god, this golden calf, sold God out for a, a, just a, amen. And they didn't even use their own stuff to do it because God allowed them to get that stuff. Look at verse 9. And the Lord said unto Moses, I have seen this people. Behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now therefore let me alone, that my wrath may wax hot against them, that I may consume them, and I will make of thee a great nation. You know what it did? They upset God pretty bad. I mean, imagine. Imagine you make something, you create something to do a, a specific job. 
You know God has a specific job for you? Amen? There's no doubt in my mind tonight that I am doing exactly what my Creator created me for. I look back my whole life, even when I was a lost kid, man, and God set me up, like the preacher said this morning. God set me up. God put me in some places where I'd see some things and learn some things that I'm still using today in the ministry that God put me in. Even in the United States Air Force, man, God taught me stuff that I used to grumble about, only to get out on a mission field somewhere, way out in the jungle, the backside of nowhere, and be standing there with a file that I used to grumble about when I was in tech school to be a, an Air Force machinist, and there I am using this hand file, filing and make, cutting threads with a file, and the Lord said, hey, remember when you were complaining about this back there? I said, yeah, Lord, you're trying to teach me to do something so I could have it for the ministry. Amen? So God's a little upset, and you can't blame him. Then you get, you get down to uh, verse 11, And Moses besought the Lord his God, and said, Lord, why doth thy wrath wax, wax hot against thy people, which thou hast brought forth out of the land of Egypt with great power, with a mighty hand? Wherefore should the Egyptians speak and say, For mischief did he bring them out, to slay them in the mountains? and to consume them from the face of the earth. Turn from thy fierce wrath, repent of this evil against thy people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, thy servants, to whom thou swear. Man, there's nothing like holding God to his word. And that's what Moses is doing right there. Not only is he pleading for the people, but he's, he's holding God to his promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Amen? And so what happens? You know the rest. Verse 14, the Lord repented of the evil which he thought to do on his people. Man, if Moses hadn't stepped in, the story would have been a whole lot different. Amen? You better thank God. You got a man of God that will pray for you. And folks, yet to this day, I see it everywhere, will not submit. I mean, to a man that gives his heart and soul to feed him, a man that gives his heart and soul to serve him, a man that gives his heart and soul to pray for him, and they treat him like and I know y'all don't do that with a preacher. I hope. Amen. And here they are. And I see it all in a lot of places. People take, you know what we do? We don't only take the preacher for granted. We take each other for granted. Amen. I mean, we left my daughter Sarah's house. Was it last night? Night before. And my wife got a text from our pastor's wife. And she didn't know it, but I knew not only the fellow that she's talking about, but his whole family, both sides of the family. I've known him for 40 years. And he's one of the ones committed suicide. And every time I get around the family, I ask him, how's he doing? How's he doing? How's he? Oh, he's doing okay. Take a look around. One of us could be gone. It doesn't have to be something like that. I mean, it could just be drop over, you know. Amen. Well, I tell you, you do a lot, man. You start worshiping the wrong God. And you start going after golden calves. You know, they have no idea that what Moses has said to God right here. He's begging God for their benefit. They got no idea. Meanwhile, Moses is up there saying, Lord, you can't do this. Please don't do this. And they're down there saying, yeah, that Moses, that rascal. He's up there playing around, you know. No, he's not. He's up there begging God for them. But God changes. He changed his mind. So then what Moses do? Moses turned, verse 15, went down from the mountain. The two tables of testimony were in his hand. The tables were written on both their sides. On the one side and the other side were they written, and the tables were the work of God. And the writing was the writing of God, graven upon the tables. And when Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said unto Moses, there's a noise of war in the camp. And he said, it is not the voice of them that shout for mastery, neither is it the voice of them that cry for being overcome, but the noise of them that do sing. The very songs that were supposed to go to God and glorify God, they're now singing 
to a false god. Because of that foolishness, the man of God gets mad now. Verse 19, it came to pass as soon as he came nigh into the camp that he saw the calf and the dancing, and Moses' anger waxed hot, and he cast the tables out of his hands and brake them beneath the mount. So now the man of God is breaking God's handiwork. He's so frustrated. See, they've not only affected themselves, now they got the man of God upset. Got God upset, too. Why? Golden calves. And now... The gold it took to make the calf is now going to be gone forever. Look at verse 20. And he took the calf which they had made and burned it in the fire and ground it to powder, strawed it upon the water, and made the children of Israel drink of it. It's gone, man. It's going out in the draft now. Burned up, ground up, gone. Ain't nobody going to ever see that gold again. And then... 21, and Moses said unto Aaron, What did this people unto thee that thou hast brought so great a sin upon them? Now look at here. And Aaron said, Let not the anger of my Lord wax hot. Thou knowest the people that they are set on mischief. You know what he did? He deferred the accountability. There's a golden calf right there, man. I see it everywhere. Ain't me. He made me do it. They made me do it. No, take account, amen, take responsibility, amen. Old self was the guy that's guilty, just, sorry, Lord, it was me, you know. You want to defer accountability. You know what David did? David's a good picture of, of, of keeping the accountability right and where to put it. Remember back there in First Chronicles, I don't know, chapter 11 somewhere, where they're uh, fighting and all that, and, and, and those men, those three mighty men, they fought their way into Bethlehem to the well and got the water and brought it back to David. What did David do? He poured it out unto the Lord. And what did he say? This isn't for me. This is for him. This is for his glory. Amen. He defers it, man, right to God. He says, yes, sir, this is for God. I'm not sticking my hand in there and stealing something that belongs to God. Amen. But Aaron, though, he, he goes ahead and blames the people. And so then he says, verse 23, For they said unto me, you know what? So what if they did? Who cares? You're the man of God, Aaron. You didn't have to do what they said. You could have, I mean, read in the riot act and said, eh, 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 eh. We ain't doing that. Amen? But no, he'd rather blame them for his actions. Verse 24, and I said unto them, Whatsoever hath any, whosoever hath any gold, let them break it off. So they gave it me. Then I cast it into the fire, and there came out this calf. Now, is that what we just read back there? Look what popped out of the fire after you got done with laying your hands on it and fixing it like it is. You know, it didn't just pop out of the fire, right? I'm telling you, man, golden calf gets you in trouble. Now, not only is he lying to God, now he's lying to the man of God. Look at verse 25. And when Moses saw the people were naked, now in the parentheses, for Aaron had made them naked. Man, he's really, they're kind of affecting each other for the wrong thing. Why? Got a golden calf in the midst. I'm telling you, man, to make your head go cuckoo. You'll do and say things you never thought you'd do and say. Amen. People get in more trouble, man, when they get golden calves and get to messing with them. Now, verse 27, he said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Put every man his sword by his side, and go in and out from gate to gate throughout the camp, and slay every man his brother, and every man his companion, every man his neighbor. Amen. Psalm 81, 15 is their epitaph, and it says this, The haters of the Lord should have submitted. You know what they had to do? If they would have submitted from the get-go to the man of God, to the will of God, none of this would have ever happened. There wouldn't have been a golden calf. There wouldn't have been something drawing away their attention. Man, I'm telling you, there's golden calves all over America now in the church. Amen. 
And I'm telling you, you know what they do? They run you. They run you. Amen. I normally have one hanging on my side, but I try to leave it home when I'm preaching, especially. Yeah. What happens? That thing demands my time. It's got this little notification thing, and I have shut every notification I can find off in that phone. But I plug that, stick that thing in my truck so I can answer somebody that calls me driving down the road, and I get this, nah, nah, or whatever it is, some weird noise. Nah, 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 and just keeps doing it. Brother Joe, if you sent me one text message, it would go, nah, 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 every 30 seconds until I pick it up, answer the text message, and put it back down. I, I shut it off. You ain't telling me what to do. You ain't running my life. I'm the guy running you. You shut up. Say, you talk to it like that. I do. Amen. Call me crazy, but why? I'm not going to be run by them crazy things. Amen. And then, and then if you if you make a phone call, now they got this thing that come through on it, and I don't even know where it came from. It's got all your calls, and it, and it gives you a note, this little notification on the screen. You used your phone two hours this week. Well, praise God it wasn't three. Amen. You'd be amazed how much time you can spend just talking sometimes. And it's business stuff most of the time. It ain't like you're just talking blah, 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 you know. But people make them golden calves, don't they? You know, then comes this thing where they get, they get a choice and, and, and they, can, they can either go with God or go their own way. You ever been there? Where you had to make the choice. I choose God, amen. I'll take God, Brother Tom. How about it? You too, huh? Amen, brother. We got the right God anyway. Verse 26. Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. And look at this, and all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together unto him. Ain't it funny? Only the cho- it only talks about the priesthood choosing God. What did everybody else do? Now, there was obviously some that did, be, or, or they stood off and didn't get mixed up in the whole thing somewhere, because it said there, verse 27, it said unto them, put, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Put every man his sword by his side, and go in and out from gate to gate, throughout the camp, and slay every man his brother, and every man his companion, and every man his neighbor. And the children of Levi did according to the word of Moses, and there fell of the people that day about 3,000 men. For Moses had said, Consecrate yourselves that today to the Lord, and every man upon his son, upon his brother, that he may bestow upon you a blessing this day. And it came to pass on the morrow that Moses said unto the people, so somebody was left, they didn't all get killed. There were some folks around there, amen, to start over with, right? And we move on with, as, you know what? It's probably those folks that heard the murmuring but didn't get involved in the rebellion. But you know what you got? Look at this. Moses is telling them, verse 31, Oh, this people have sinned a great sin and have made them gods of gold. You know what that is? That's guilt by association. Be careful, Christian, who you associate with. That book still says, 1 Corinthians 15, 33, Evil communications corrupt good manners. And I'm watching it wholesale across this country. You've got to pick your friends, your close friends, carefully. Amen. Hey, Jesus did. He had 12 disciples, but three of them were closer. Amen. I mean, you've got to watch it. Amen. Why? Because next, time, next thing you know, you'll be the one that's not here. Oh, not me. You're the one. Amen. Why? Man, I'm telling you, golden calves are pretty. Somebody brings in a golden calf, man, and they can draw you aside pretty easy. Here's one. I wasn't going to kick it, but I will. I love you, folks. I'm serious. 
I'm seeing this as a problem everywhere I go almost. And the preacher said it this morning, he held up that little rectangular thing, cell phone. And guys got their gurus. Would you do yourself? Would you do your brethren? Would you do your church a favor? Get rid of the guru. Get you a God, the right God. Get in that book. Get on your face. Get, amen. Get with God and find out what God wants you to do and then do it with all your might. Why? You won't need a guru. And there's some good guys out there, I know. But what I'm finding is some of them good guys are telling folks to go to good churches. When they get to good churches, they can't listen to nothing. Because my guru says, what's your God say? Preacher said it, man. You got a, you got a church. You got a God, you got a church. God designed the local church to be the pillar and ground of the truth. In other words, if it's the pillar and ground, that means it's the foundation. Being solid in a good church is foundational. You don't get that and you don't make it. Period. And it said this, pillar and ground of the proof. Now, you were an elect uh, electronics tech. What's a ground do for a circuit? It completes it. You want to be complete? Get in the pillar and ground of the truth and stop. Stay with all you got and fight for it. Amen. That's my church. You don't like it? There's the door. Don't let her bump you on the rear side on the way out. You're not going to talk about my church, my brethren, my pastor that way. Amen. Preacher, that's mean. I'll guarantee you it'll stop the nonsense. They won't be bringing any golden calves up to show you. Say, so how do you know? Call it experience. Amen? They had guilt by association. Now, look at verse 34. We're almost done. We're close to the end. Everybody, whew, praise God. Verse 34, therefore now go, lead the people unto the place which I have spoken unto thee. Behold, mine angels shall go before thee. Nevertheless, in the day when I visit, I will visit their sin upon them. Whoa. I think the preacher hit it. Numbers, was it 23 this morning? Be sure your sin will find you out. God said, I'm going to visit it upon them. They're going to know, you know what? Imagine now, they're on their way to this place where God told Moses, take them there. And all the way across the desert, Joe, every step of the way, they're thinking, I'm going to meet God up here. And it ain't going to be fun. Wouldn't it have been a whole lot better just to submit to God and God's plan and work within the parameters God set up? And then you don't have to worry about it. Man, then you put your head on the pillow, there's peace. Amen. Hey, man, there's no worries. Hey, man, hey, if I die right now, I'm going to heaven. Praise God, and I'm going to meet my Savior. Hey, Amen. And to the best of my knowledge, I've put everything under the blood. I've made it right. Hey, Amen. Thank you, Lord. And whatever happens, happens. That's a wonderful way to go. But all the way across the desert, man, they had this thing hanging over their head. The Bible says, verse 35, the Lord plagued the people. Because they made the calf which Aaron made. Man, they know at every step, they know when I get where we're going, and when we all get where we're going, I'm going to have to face my sin before my God. And he ain't happy. But man, if you can keep that thing right, I heard it said earlier, I don't remember if it was Brother Joe or the preacher, but keep short accounts. Keep short accounts. Man, what a blessing it is to have a short account. And 
and then something goes wrong, and the first thing you can do is go, Whew, thank God everything's okay between me and God. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. So, what's your golden calf? Maybe you don't have one, but maybe somebody's been flashing one at you. You know what they're doing? They're trying to get you out of the will of God. They're trying to get your mind on something it shouldn't be on. Why? Then you can't fulfill the will of God. And you know what that does? That makes them look good. Because now you look like them, see? Sometimes we are our own. Just ask you a question. What will your Christian epitaph be? I was going to preach another message. The title of the message is Building a Lasting Legacy. It's out of 1 Chronicles where he said, let us arise and build. And what they're talking about was building this temple and the temple of God. And we are the temple of God. We ought to be building ourselves. Why? With something that lasts. So that when we're gone, like the Bible said about Enoch, was it Enoch, he being dead yet speaketh, or was it Abraham, I forget. But he being dead yet speaketh. There's some guys we know, I mean, I could bring up names, and we've all heard them. Charles Haddon Spurgeon, Dwight L. Moody, you know, William Carey. I'll close this illustration. Many years ago, I was down in Tennessee, back in the backwoods, in a mission conference. First mission conference that church ever had. It would have been about 1988. And I was down there preaching. And uh, this fellow come up to me, a little short fella, real slight man, not real big or muscular or anything. He was an Indian fellow from India. And uh, he came walking up to me, and I had just preached, and I'd used Carey in one of my illustrations, William Carey. And he said, Brother Cliff, he said, I bet I got a testimony you've never heard. And I said, what's that? He said, I got saved in a church that William Carey started. I said, wow, man. Back then, that was about 160 years or something like that, you know, since William Carey started the church, and it's still there, still preaching the gospel, still going on for God. I've had the privilege in a few places. I preached in one in, in New Jersey. I preached their 150th anniversary. And it had been a Baptist church since day one, preaching the gospel, standing for the King James Bible. 150 years. Man, that's the kind of legacy that we need. I realize it don't happen everywhere. But I'm telling you, our life ought to go on long after we do. And it ought to go on in such a way that there's somebody following after that's the way the Lord set this thing up. That's why we're supposed to go train men. Why? Because they'll train other men who will train other men who will train other men. And you'll never know. You'll never know until you get home just what God did with you till you get there. Just like Poo Poo, I had no idea he was even on the mission station. He was serving the Lord. No idea. I had forgot all about him. Like I said, I only saw him one time. He did not come out of the jungle. But he, he did one day, and he got in, hair hide and all. He got saved because he saw somebody whose God was greater than his God. Amen. See, leave the golden calves alone. Leave that kind of stuff, that worldly stuff alone, and what do you get? You get to build a testimony with something that's real. And God begins to use you, and people begin to notice there's something about you. And long after you're gone, even you leave a job sometimes, and some, they'll be talking about you in the office long after you're gone, saying, yeah, but I'll tell you what about that old boy. I'll tell you what about that gal. She knew God, and your testimony goes on. I've heard stories, times, I could stand here and tell them all night long. I love stories. But the point is this. 
Got any golden calves? Anybody been flashing one at you? Be careful if they take you up next to the fire and that thing, you see that thing melting there. You know what happens when you melt gold, don't you? Scum comes to the top. You don't want any of that on you. No. Live your life for Jesus Christ. Let God be your God all the way. Do what he says do, period. Let nothing get in the way. Do exactly what he says do. It might be crazy, Joe. I've done some crazy things only to find later that God was in it all the way Amen. and God used it to either see somebody saved or help some soul that was struggling. Now, you never know, but just obey God and do what he says. Father, Father,